The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Making them pens was a distressed tough job, and so was the saw, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which the prisoner has to scrabble on the wall. But he had to have it. Tom said he got to. There warn't no case of a state prisoner not scrabbling his inscription to leave behind, and his coat of arms. Look at Lady Jane Grey, he says. Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northumberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it? Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do. Jim says, Why, Mars Tom, I hain't got no coat of arm. I hain't got nothing but dish your old shirt, and you knows I got to keep the journal on that. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well, I says, Jim's right anyway when he says he ain't got no coat of arms, because he hain't. I reckon I knowed that, Tom says, but you bet he'll have one before he goes out of this, because he's going out right, and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record. So whilst me and Jim filed away at the pens on a brick bat apiece, Jim a-making his'n out of the brass, and I making mine out of the spoon, Tom set to work to think out the coat of arms. By and by he said he'd struck so many good ones he didn't hardly know which to take, but there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on. He says, On the scutcheon we'll have a bend oar in the dexter base, a saltire murray in the fess, with a dog couchant for common charge, and under his foot a chain embattled for slavery, with a chevron vert in a chief engrailed, and three invected lines on a field azure, with the nombral points rampant on a danset indented, crest a runaway nigger, sable, with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister, and a couple of ghouls for supporters, which is you and me, motto, Maggiore fretta, minore auto. Got it out of a book. Means the more haste, the less speed. Gee, willikins, I says. But what does the rest of it mean? We ain't got no time to bother over that, he says. We got to dig in like all get out. Well, anyway, I says, what's some of it? What's a fess? A fess is a, f a fess. A fess is. You don't need to know what a fess is. I'll show him how to make it when he gets to it. Shucks, Tom, I says. I think you might tell a person. What's a bar sinister? Oh, I don't know, but he's got to have it. All the nobility does. <sighs> that was just his way. If it didn't suit him to explain a thing to you, he wouldn't do it. You might pump at him a week. It would make no difference. he got all that coat of arms business fixed, so now he started in to finish up the rest of that part of the work, which was to plan out a mournful inscription. Said Jim got to have one, like they all done. He made up a lot, wrote them out on a paper, and read them off so. 1. Here a captive heart busted. 2. Here a poor prisoner, forsook by the world and friends, fretted his sorrowful life. 3. Here a lonely heart broke, and a worn spirit went to its rest after thirty-seven years of solitary captivity. 4. Here, homeless and friendless, after thirty-seven years of bitter captivity, perished a noble stranger, natural son of Louis the Fourteenth. Tom's voice trembled whilst he was reading them, and he most broke down. When he got done he could no way make up his mind which one for Jim to scrabble on to the wall. They was all so good. But at last he allowed he would let him scrabble them all on. Jim said it would take him a year to scrabble such a lot of truck on to the logs with a nail, and he didn't know how to make them letters besides. But Tom said he would block them out for him, and then he wouldn't have nothing to do but just follow the lines. 
Then pretty soon he says, "'Come to think, the logs ain't a-going to do. They don't have log walls in a dungeon. We got to dig the inscriptions into a rock. We'll fetch a rock.' Jim said the rock was worse than the logs. He said it would take him such a poison long time to dig them into a rock he wouldn't ever get out. But Tom said he would let me help him do it. Then he took a look to see how me and Jim was getting along with the pens. It was most pesky, tedious, hard work and slow, and didn't give my hands no show to get well of the sores, and we didn't seem to make no headway, hardly. So Tom says, I know how to fix it. We got to have a rock for the coat of arms and mournful inscriptions, and we can kill two birds with that same rock. There's a gaudy big grindstone down at the mill, and we'll smooch it, and carve the things on it, and file out the pens and the saw on it, too. It warn't no slouch of an idea, and it warn't no slouch of a grindstone, nother, but we allowed we'd tackle it. It warn't quite midnight yet, so we cleared out for the mill, leaving Jim at work. We smooched the grindstone, and set out to roll her home, but it was a most nation-tough job. Sometimes, do what we could, we couldn't keep her from falling over, and she come mighty near mashing us every time. Tom said she was going to get one of us sure before we got through. We got her halfway and then we was plum played out, and most drownded with sweat. We see it warn't no use, we got to go and fetch Jim. So he raised up his bed and slid the chain off of the bed leg, and wrapped it round and round his neck, and we crawled out through our hole and down there, and Jim and me laid into that grindstone and walked her along like nothing, and Tom superintended. He could out-superintend any boy I ever see. He knowed how to do everything. Our hole was pretty big, but it warn't big enough to get the grindstone through. But Jim, he took the pick and soon made it big enough. Then Tom marked out them things on it with the nail, and set Jim to work on them, with the nail for a chisel, and an iron bolt from the rubbish and the lean-to for a hammer, and told him to work till the rest of his candle quit on him, and then he could go to bed, and hide the grindstone under his straw tick, and sleep on it. Then we helped him fix his chain back on the bed leg, and was ready for bed ourselves. But Tom thought of something, and says, "'You got any spiders in here, Jim?' "'No, sir. Thanks to goodness I hain't, Mars Tom.' "'All right. We'll get you some.' "'But bless you, honey, I don't want none. I's afeard of em. I'd just soon have rattlesnakes around. Tom thought a minute or two and says, It's a good idea, and I reckon it's been done. It must have been done. It stands to reason. Yes, it's a prime good idea. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Mars Tom? Why, a rattlesnake. The goodness gracious alive, Mars Tom. Why, if there was a rattlesnake to come in here, I'd take and bust right out through that log wall, I would, with my head. Why, Jim, you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little. You could tame it. Tame it? Yes, easy enough. Every animal is grateful for kindness and petting, and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them. Any book will tell you that. You try, that's all I ask, just try for two or three days. Why, you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you, and sleep with you, and won't stay away from you a minute, and will let you wrap him round your neck and put his head in your mouth. Please, Mars Tom, don't talk so. I can't stand it. He'd let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor, ain't it? I lay he'd wait a powerful long time for I asked him, and more than that, I don't want him to sleep with me. Jim, don't act so foolish. A prisoner's got to have some kind of a dumb pet, and if a rattlesnake hasn't ever been tried, why, there's more glory to be gained in your being the first to ever try it than any other way you could ever think of to save your life. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no such glory. 
Snake take and bite Jim's chin off, den wear it the glory. No, sir, I don't want no such doings. Blame it, can't you try? I only want you to try. You needn't keep it up if it don't work. But the trouble all done if the snake bite me while I's a tryin him. Mars Tom, I'm willin to tackle most anything that ain't unreasonable. But if you and Huck fetches a rattlesnake in here for me to tame, I's going to leave that shore. Well, then, let it go, let it go, if you're so bullheaded about it. We can get you some garter snakes, and you can tie some buttons on their tails, and let on their rattlesnakes, and I reckon that'll have to do. I can stand them, Mars Tom, but blame if I couldn't get along without em. I tell you that. I never knowed before it was so much bother and trouble to be a prisoner. Well, it always is when it's done right. You got any rats round here? No, sir, I ain't seen none. Well, we'll get you some rats. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no rats. Dey's the dead blamest creatures to disturb a body and rustle round over em and bite his feet when he's trying to sleep I ever see. No, sir, give me garter snakes if I's got to have em, but don't give me no rats. I ain't got no use for em, scarcely. But, Jim, you got to have em, they all do. So don't make no more fuss about it. Prisoners ain't ever without rats. There ain't no instance of it. And they train them and pet them and learn them tricks, and they get to be as sociable as flies. But you got to play music to them. You got anything to play music on? I ain't got nothing but a coarse comb and a piece of paper and a juice harp, but I reckon they wouldn't take no stock in a juice harp. Yes, they would. They don't care what kind of music tis. A juice harp's plenty good enough for a rat. All animals like music. In a prison they dote on it. Especially painful music and you can't get no other kind out of a Jew's harp. It always interests them. They come out to see what's the matter with you. Yes, you're all right. You're fixed very well. You want to sit on your bed nights before you go to sleep and early in the mornings and play your Jew's harp. Play The Last Link is Broken. That's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. And when you've played about two minutes, you'll see all the rats and the snakes and spiders and things begin to feel worried about you and come, and they'll just fairly swarm over you and have a noble good time. Yes, they will, I reckon, Mars Tom, but what kind of time is Jim having? Blessed if I can see the point. But I'll do it if I got to. I reckon I'd better keep the animal satisfied and not have no trouble in the house. Tom waited to think it over and see if there weren't nothing else, and pretty soon he says, Oh, there's one thing I forgot. Could you raise a flower here, do you reckon? I don't know, but maybe I could, Mars Tom. But it's tolerable dark in here, and I ain't got no use for no flower no how and she'd be a powerful sight of trouble. Well, you try it anyway. Some other prisoners has done it. One or dem big cat-tail-looking mullin stalks would grow in here, Mars Tom, I reckon, but she wouldn't be worth half the trouble she'd cost. Don't you believe it. We'll fetch you a little one, and you plant it in the corner over there, and raise it. And don't call it mullin, call it pitchiola. That's its right name when it's in a prison, and you want to water it with your tears. Why, I got plenty of spring water, Mars Tom. You don't want spring water, you want to water it with your tears. It's the way they always do. Why, Mars Tom, I lay I can raise one of dem mullin stalks twice with spring water whilst another man's a startin' one with tears. That ain't the idea. You got to do it with tears. She'll die on my hands, Mars Tom, she surely will, cause I don't scarcely ever cry. So Tom was stumped, but he studied it over, and then said Jim would have to worry along the best he could with an onion. He promised he would go to the nigger cabins and drop one, private, 
in Jim's coffee pot in the morning. Jim said he would just as soon have tobacco in his coffee, and found so much fault with it, and with the work and bother of raising the mullen, and Jews harping the rats, and petting and flattering up the snakes and spiders and things, on top of all the other work he had to do on pens, and inscriptions, and journals and things, which made it more trouble and worry and responsibility to be a prisoner than anything he ever undertook, the Tom most lost all patience with him, said he was just loading down with more gaudier chances than a prisoner ever had in the world to make a name for himself, and yet he didn't know enough to appreciate them, and they was just about wasted on him. So Jim he was sorry, and said he wouldn't behave so no more and then me and Tom shove for bed. End of chapter. In chapter 39 In the morning we went up to the village and bought a wire rat trap and fetched it down, and unstopped the best rat hole, and in about an hour we had fifteen of the bulliest kind of ones, and then we took it and put it in a safe place under Aunt Sally's bed. But while we was gone for spiders, little Thomas Franklin, Benjamin Jefferson, Alexander Phelps, found it there, and opened the door of it to see if the rats would come out. And they did. And Aunt Sally, she come in, and when we got back, she was a-standin' on top of the bed raising cane, and the rats was doing what they could to keep off the dull times for her. So she took and dusted us both with a hickory and we was as much as two hours catching another fifteen or sixteen. Drat that meddlesome cup, and they weren't the likeliest nother, because the first haul was the pick of the flock. I never see a likelier lot of rats than what that first haul was. We got a splendid stock of sorted spiders, and bugs, and frogs, and caterpillars, and one thing or another, and we liked to got a hornet's nest, but we didn't. The family was at home. We didn't give it right up, but stayed with them as long as we could, because we allowed we'd tire them out, or they'd got to tire us out, and they done it. Then we got Allie Cumpain and rubbed on the places, and was pretty near all right again, but couldn't set down convenient. And so we went for the snakes, and grabbed a couple of dozen garters and house snakes, and put them in a bag, and put it in our room and by that time it was supper-time, and a rattling good honest day's work. And hungry? Oh, no, I reckon not. And there weren't a blessed snake up there when we went back. We didn't half-tie the sack, and they worked out somehow and left. But it didn't matter much, because they were still on the premises somewheres. So we judged we could get some of them again. No, there weren't no real scarcity of snakes about the house for a considerable spell. You'd see them tripping from the rafters in places every now and then, and they generally landed in your plate, or down the back of your neck, and most of the time where you didn't want them. Well, they was handsome and striped, and there weren't no harm in a million of them, but that never made no difference to Aunt Sally. She despised snakes, be the breed what they might, and she couldn't stand them no way you could fix it. And every time one of them flopped down on her, it did make no difference what she was doing. She would just lay that work down and light out. I never see such a woman. And you could hear her whoop to Jericho. You couldn't get her to take a hold of one of them with the tongs. And if she turned over and found one in bed, she would scramble out and lift the house so you would think the house was afire. She disturbed the old man so that he said he could most wish there hadn't ever been no snakes created. Why, after every last snake had been gone clear out of the house for as much as a week, Aunt Sally weren't over it yet, and she weren't near over it. When she was settin' thinkin' about something, you could touch her on the back of her neck with a feather, and she would jump right out of her stockings. It was very curious, but Tom said all women was just so. He said they was made that way, for some reason or other. We got a lickin' every time one of our snakes come in her way, and she allowed these lickin's weren't nothin' to what she would do if we ever loaded up the place again with them. I didn't mind the lickin's, because they didn't amount to nothin', but I minded the trouble we had to lay in another lot. But we got them laid in, 
and all the other things, and you never see a cabin as blithesome as Jim's was when they'd all swarm out for music and go for him. Jim didn't like the spiders, and the spiders didn't like Jim, and so they'd lay for him, and make it mighty warm for him. And he said that between the rats and the snakes and the grindstone there weren't no room in bed for him scarcely, and when there was a body couldn't sleep, it was so lively, and it was always lively, he said, because they never all slept at one time, but took turn about. So when the snakes was asleep the rats was on deck, and when the rats turned in the snakes come on watch. So he always had one gang under him, in his way, and the other gang having a circus over him. And if he got up to hunt a new place the spiders would take a chance at him as he crossed over. He said if he ever got out this time he wouldn't ever be a prisoner again, not for a salary. Well, by the end of three weeks everything was in pretty good shape. The shirt was sent in early, in a pie, and every time a rat bit Jim he would get up and write a little in his journal while the ink was fresh. The pens was made, the inscriptions and so on was carved on the grindstone, the bed leg was sawed in two, and we had et up the sawdust, and it give us a most amazing stomach ache. We reckoned we was all going to die but didn't. It was the most undigestible sawdust I ever see, and Tom said the same. But as I was saying, we we got all the work done now, at last, and we was all pretty much fagged out, too, but mainly Jim. The old man had wrote a couple of times to the plantation below Orleans to come and get their runaway nigger, but hadn't got no answer, because there weren't no such plantation. So he allowed he would advertise Jim in the St. Louis and New Orleans papers, and when he mentioned the St. Louis ones, it give me the cold shivers, and I see we had no time to lose. So Tom said, now for the anonymous letters. What's them? I says. Warnings to the people that something is up. Sometimes it's done one way, sometimes another. But there's always somebody spying around that gives notice to the governor of the castle. When Louis the Sixteenth was going to light out of the Tuileries, a servant girl done it. It's a very good way, and so is the anonymous letters. We'll use them both. And it's usual for the prisoner's mother to change clothes with him, and she stays in, and he slides out in her clothes. We'll do that, too. But looky here, Tom, what do we want to warn anybody for that something's up? Let them find it out for themselves. It's their lookout. Yes, I know, but you can't depend on them. It's the way they've acted from the very start. Left us to do everything. They're so confiding and mullet-headed, they wouldn't take no notice of nothing at all. So if we don't give them notice, there won't be nobody nor nothing to interfere with us. And so after all our hard work and trouble, this escape will go off perfectly flat. Won't amount to nothing. Won't be nothing to it. Well, as for me, Tom, that's the way I'd like. Shucks, he says, and looked disgusted. So I says, but I ain't going to make no complaint. Any way that suits you suits me. What are you going to do about the servant girl? You'll be her. You slide in in the middle of the night and hook that yaller girl's frock. Why, Tom, that'll make trouble next morning, because, of course, she probably ain't got any but that one. I know, but you don't want it but fifteen minutes to carry the anonymous letter and shove it in under the front door. All right, then, I'll do it, but I could carry it just as handy in my own togs. You wouldn't look like a servant girl, then, would you? No, but there won't be nobody to see what I look like, anyway. That ain't nothing to do with it. The thing for us to do is just to do our duty, and not worry about whether anybody sees us do it or not. Ain't you got no principle at all? All right, I ain't saying nothing. I'm the servant girl. Who's Jim's mother? I am his mother. I'll hook a gown from Aunt Sally. Well, then, you'll have to stay in the cabin when me and Jim leaves. 
Not much. I'll stuff Jim's clothes full of straw and lay it on his bed to represent his mother in disguise, and Jim will take the nigger woman's gown off of me and wear it, and we'll all evade together. When a prisoner of style escapes, it's called an evasion. It's always called so when a king escapes, for instance. And the same with a king's son. It don't make no difference whether he's a natural one or an unnatural one. So Tom, he wrote the anonymous letter, and I smooched the yaller wench's frock that night and put it on and shoved it under the front door the way Tom told me to. It said, Beware. Trouble is brewing. Keep a sharp lookout. Unknown friend. Next night we stuck a picture, which Tom drawed in blood, of a skull and crossbones on the front door, and next night another one of a coffin on the back door. I never see a family in such a sweat. They couldn't have been worth scared if the place had been full of ghosts laying for them behind everything and under the beds and shivering through the air. If a door banged, Aunt Sally, she jumped and said, Ouch! If anything fell, she jumped and said, Ouch! If you happened to touch her when she weren't noticing, she'd done the same. She couldn't face no way and be satisfied, because she allowed there was something behind her every time. So she was always a-whirling around sudden, and saying, Ouch! And before she'd got two-thirds around, she'd whirl back again, and say it again. And she was afraid to go to bed. But she dasn't set up. So the thing was working very well, Tom said. He said he never see a thing work more satisfactory. He said it showed it was done right. So we said, Now for the grand bulge. So the very next morning at the streak of dawn we got another letter ready, and was wondering what we better do with it, because we heard them say at supper they was going to have a nigger on watch at both doors all night. Tommy went down the lightning rod to spy around, and the nigger at the back door was asleep, and he stuck it in the back of his neck and come back. This letter said, Don't betray me. I wish to be your friend. There is a desperate gang of cutthroats from over in the Indian Territory, going to steal your runaway nigger to-night, and they have been trying to scare you so as you will stay in the house and not bother them. I am one of the gang, but have got religion, and wish to quit it, and lead an honest life again, and will betray the hellish design. They will sneak down from northards, along the fence, at midnight exact, with a false key, and go in the nigger's cabin to get him. I am to be off a piece and blow a tin horn if I see any danger, but stead of that I will ba like a sheep soon as they get in and not blow at all. Then whilst they are getting his chains loose, you slip there and lock them in, and can kill them at your leisure. Don't do anything but just the way I am telling you, if you do, they will suspicion something, and raise whoop jamboree who. I do not wish any reward, but to know I have done the right thing. Unknown Friend End of chapter Chapter 40 We was feeling pretty good after breakfast, and took my canoe and went over the river a-fishing, with a lunch, and had a good time and took a look at the raft and found her all right, and got home late to supper, and found them in such a sweat and worry they didn't know which end they was standing on, and made us go right off to bed the minute we was done supper, and wouldn't tell us what the trouble was, and never let on a word about the new letter, but didn't need to, because we knowed as much about it as anybody did, and as soon as we was half upstairs and her back was turned we slid for the cellar cupboard, and loaded up a good lunch, and took it up to our room and went to bed, and got up about half-past eleven, and Tom put on Aunt Sally's dress that he stole and was going to start with the lunch, but says, "'Where's the butter?' "'I laid out a hunk of it,' I says, "'on a piece of a corn-bone.' "'Well, you left it laid out, then. It ain't here.' "'We can get along without it,' I says." We can get along with it, too, he says. Just you slide down cellar and fetch it. 
and then mosey right down the lightning rod and come along. I'll go and stuff the straw into Jim's clothes to represent his mother in disguise, and be ready to buy like a sheep and shove soon as you get there. So out he went, and down cellar went I. The hunk of butter, big as a person's fist, was where I had left it, so I took up the slab of corn pone with it on, and blowed out my light, and started upstairs very stealthy, and got up to the main floor all right. But here comes Aunt Sally with a candle, and I clapped the truck in my hat and clapped my hat on my head, and the next second she see me, and she says, "'You been down cellar?' "'Yes, am "'What you been doing down there?' "'Nothing.' "'Nothing?' "'No, am "'Well, then, what possessed you to go down there this time of night?' "'I, I don't know, am "'You don't know?' Don't answer me that way. Tom, I want to know what you've been doing down there. I ain't been doing a single thing, Aunt Sally. I hope to gracious if I have. I reckon she'd let me go now, and as a general thing, she would. But I suppose there were so many strange things going on, she just in a sweat about every little thing that weren't yardstick straight. So she says, very decided, you just march into that settin' room and stay there till I come. You've been up to something you've no business to, and I lay I'll find out what it is before I'm done with you. So she went away as I opened the door and walked into the settin' room. My, but there was a crowd there. Fifteen farmers, and every one of them had a gun. I was most powerful sick, and slunk to a chair and sat down. They was settin' around, some of them talkin' a little in a low voice, and all of them fidgety and uneasy, but trying to look like they weren't. But I knowed they was, because they was always takin' off their hats and puttin' them on, and scratchin' their heads and changin' their seats and fumblin' with their buttons. I warn't easy myself, but I didn't take my hat off all the same. I did wish Aunt Sally would come and get done with me and lick me if she wanted to, and let me get away and tell Tom how we'd overdone this thing, and what a thundering hornet's nest we'd a got ourselves into, so we could stop foolin' around straight off and clear out with Jim before these rips got out of the patience and come for us. At last she come and begun to ask me questions, but I couldn't answer them straight. I didn't know which end of me was up because these men was in such a fidget now that some was wantin' to start right now and lay for them desperados, and sayin' it warn't but a few minutes to midnight, and others was trying to get them to hold on and wait for the sheep signal, and here was Auntie pecking away at the questions, and me a shakin' all over and ready to sink down in my tracks I was that scared, and the place gettin' hotter and hotter and the butter beginning to melt and run down my neck and behind my ears. And pretty soon, when one of them says, I'm for going and getting in the cabin first and right now, and catching them when they come, I most dropped, and a streak of butter come a-trickling down my forehead, and Aunt Sally, she see it, and turns white as a sheet, and says, For the land's sake, what is the matter with the child? He's got the brain fever as sure as you're born, and they're oozing out. And everybody runs to see, and she snatches off my hat, and out comes the bread and what was left of the butter, and she grabbed me and hugged me and says, Oh, what a turn you did give me, and how glad and grateful I am it ain't no worse, for luck's against us, and it never rains but it pours. And when I see that truck I thought we'd lost you, for I knowed by the color and all it was just like your brains would be if— Dear, dear, why didn't you tell me that was what you'd been down there for? I wouldn't a cared. Now clear out to bed, and don't let me see no more of you till morning. I was upstairs in a second, and down the lightning rod in another one, and shinning through the dark for the lean-to. I couldn't hardly get my words out, I was so anxious— but I told Tom as quick as I could we must jump for it now, and not a minute to lose. The house was full of men yonder, with guns. His eyes just blazed, and he says, No, is that so? Ain't it bully? Why, Huck, 
If it was to do over again, I bet I could fetch two hundred. If we could put it off till— Hurry, hurry, I says. Where's Jim? Right at your elbow. If you reach out your arm, you can touch him. He's dressed and everything's ready. Now we'll slide out and give the sheep signal. But then we heard the tramp of men coming to the door, and heard them beginning to fumble with the padlock, and heard a man say, I told you we'd be too soon. They haven't come. The door is locked. Here, I'll lock some of you into the cabin. You lay for em in the dark and kill em when they come, and the rest scatter round a piece, and listen if you can hear em coming. So in they come, but couldn't see us in the dark, and most trod on us whilst we was hustling to get under the bed. But we got under all right, and out through the hole, swift but soft, Jim first, me next, and Tom last, which was according to Tom's orders. Now we was in the lean-to, and heard trampings close by outside. So we crept to the door, and Tom stopped us there and put his eye to the crack. We couldn't make out nothing, it was so dark, and whispered and said he would listen for the steps to get further, and when he nudged us, Jim must glide out first, and him last. So he set his ear to the crack and listened, and listened, and listened, and the steps are scraping around out there all the time, and at last he nudged us and we slid out, and stooped down, not breathing, and not making the least noise, and slipped stealthy towards the fence and engine file, and got to it all right, and me and Jim over it. But Tom's britches catch fast on a splinter on the top rail, and then he hear the steps coming, so he had a pull loose, which snapped the splinter and made a noise. And as he dropped in our tracks and started, somebody sings out, "'Who's that? Answer, or I'll shoot!' But we didn't answer. We just unfurled our heels and shoved. Then there was a rush, and a bang, 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 and the bullets fairly whizzed around us. We heard them sing out, "'Here they are! They broke for the river! After em, boys, and turn loose the dogs!' So here they come, full tilt. We could hear them because they wore boots and yelled, but we didn't wear no boots and didn't yell. We was in the path to the mill, and when they got pretty close on to us, we dodged into the bush and let them go by, and then dropped in behind them. They'd had all the dogs shut up, so they wouldn't scare off the robbers, but by this time somebody had let them loose, and here they come, making powwow enough for a million. But they was our dogs so we stopped in our tracks till they catched up. And when they see it warn't nobody but us, and no excitement to offer them, they only just said, Howdy, and tore right ahead towards the shouting and clattering, and then we up steam again, and whizzed along after them till we was nearly to the mill, and then struck up through the bush to where my canoe was tied, and hopped in and pulled for dear life towards the middle of the river but didn't make no more noise than we was obliged to. Then we struck out, easy and comfortable, for the island where my raft was, and we could hear them yelling and barking at each other all up and down the bank, till we was so far away the sounds got dim and died out. And when we stepped on to the raft, I says, Now, old Jim, you're a free man again, and I bet you won't ever be a slave no more. And a mighty good job it was, too, Huck. It is plan beautiful, and it was done beautiful, and they ain't nobody can get up a plan that's more mixed up and splendid than what dat one was. We was all glad as we could be, but Tom was the gladdest of all because he had a bullet in the calf of his leg. When me and Jim heard that, we didn't feel so brash as what we did before. It was hurting him considerable, and bleeding, so we laid him in the wigwam and tore up one of the duke's shirts for uh, to bandage him, but he says, "'Give me the rags. I can do it myself. Don't stop now. Don't fool around here, and the evasion boobin' along so handsome. Man the sweeps, and set her loose. Boys, we done it elegant. Deed we did. I wish we'd a had the handling of Louis sixteen and there wouldn't have been no son of St. Louis ascend to heaven, wrote down in his biography, 
No, sir, we'd a whooped him over the border. That's what we'd a done with him. And done it just as slick as nothing at all, too. Man the sweeps! Man the sweeps! But me and Jim was consulting and thinking. And after we'd thought a minute, I says, Say it, Jim. So he says, Well, then, this is the way it looked to me, Huck. If it was him that has been sought free, and one of the boys was to get shot, would he say, Go on and save me, never mind about a doctor for to save this one? Is dat like Mars Tom Sawyer? Would he say dat? You bet he wouldn't. Well, then, is Jim going to say it? No, sir, I don't budge a step out in this place without a doctor, not if it's forty year. I knowed he was white inside, and I reckon he'd say what he did say. So it was all right now, and I told Tom I was a-going for a doctor. He raised considerable row about it, but me and Jim stuck to it, and wouldn't budge. So he was for crawling out and setting the raft loose himself, but we wouldn't let him. Then he give us a piece of his mind, but it didn't do no good. So when he sees me getting the canoe ready, he says, Well, then, if you're bound to go, I'll tell you the way to do when you get to the village. Shut the door and blindfold the doctor tight and fast, and make him swear to be silent as the grave, and put a purse full of gold in his hand and then take and lead him all around the back alleys and everywheres in the dark, and then fetch him here in the canoe, in a roundabout way amongst the islands, and search him and take his chalk away from him, and don't give it back to him till you get him back to the village, or else he will chalk this raft so he can find it again. It's the way they all do. So I said I would, and left, and Jim was to hide in the woods when he see the doctor coming, till he was gone again. End of chapter.